Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope that this is working okay. Yeah, it seems like it is. Uh, welcome to another fine installment of Astro 322, or at least an installment. Uh, today I wanted to get started with a little bit of logistics, and then we'll hopefully wrap up our study of the interstellar medium so that we can then move on after reading break into galaxies as a whole. Kind of, We've completely set the stage, now we put on the play. Uh, to get started, uh, there are some logistical points. If you haven't seen it on the Discord, uh, basically it's a crap time for everybody. Um, and so I moved the homework due date uh, back 24 hours uh, to Saturday at 5 p.m. Uh, but, you know, I the intention here is really just to give you a little bit of space in wrapping up the weekend and uh, wrapping up your reading break. I really would like it if you then are able to experience reading break as a time free from Astro 322. So, you know, if I put it due on the Friday of reading break, that would be kind of annoying. And then you would just have something over your head. So I figure, you know, there's, there's something virtuous in deadlines, um, but, you know, give you a little bit of space on it. So just get it wrapped up and then we can take a little bit of, uh, you know, stick our heads up and actually look around a bit um, over reading break and then come back. So homework six is then due in March which is kind of mind-boggling to me, really. Uh, so it'll be Friday, March 4th at uh, 5 p.m. Homework 7, then, I think, is due after the midterm, which is coming up on the 11th of March, which is kind of, wow, mind-boggling. Anyways, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is I've posted a midterm feedback form at the top of eClass. Uh, it's just a short little uh, sort of how we do in uh, questionnaire. And there's a secret word at the end of it. Um, if you record what the secret word is and you submit it with your homework, you'll get five points of extra credit on homework six. Uh, so that just adds stuff up. Uh, go ahead and uh, fill it in. It's completely anonymous. And um, you know, if you get the secret word from your friends, I'll never know or something like that. Uh, but just go ahead and fill in the, the top secret word and you'll get five extra credit points. But critically, the whole role of this is to get uh, some feedback from you about how this is going. Uh, most of the time when we're interacting, you're tiny black boxes here on my Zoom screen, so I don't get to sort of see the sort of, you know, dazed looks of like, ooh, that that did not work uh, that I get in person, or okay, we are going way too slow, or whatever. Uh, so what's going to happen um, with that is I really do would like to sort of integrate some feedback. In particular, how are we spending our time? And so I want to sort of uh, get some sense from you about like what is useful, what isn't useful in the class, and if there are concrete things that I can do that's supremely uh, helpful right now. So far, I've received um, some feedback a uh, little bit informally on how to structure times and uh, in class, and it was kind of two samples that were on completely opposite ends of the spectrum of like, you know, spend more time going over content, spend more time doing difficult problems, don't worry about the content. So I kind of need like a good sense of where we're at on how we spend our time in lecture so that we can make the most use of time. You know, the, uh, the truism that I sort of trot out is like, I know all of this stuff and so, it doesn't help for me to, it's not helpful for me to do it the way I think I, we should do it. I think we should sort of get a sense of how you think we should do it and what's helpful for you. So now that we're part way in and you get a sense of my style, uh, that'll hopefully give you a sense of like, okay, here's where uh, lecture time is most useful. These are the activities we do in the lecture that are really helping me. Uh, this is the stuff that completely sucks and I don't really care for it. So that's the kind of feedback I care about. It's anonymous. I have, you know, been called all kinds of names on uh, student feedback forms and anonymous forums. Uh, so don't be shy. Uh, I, I have heard it all before. Uh, I will um, just go into the corner, uh, drink, and cry myself to sleep. I mean, it'll be fine. Yeah, we're, we're all good. Uh, okay, so I mean, and uh, by all of that, you just have to remember, this is my first time teaching this class. I am writing a book and homework assignments and coming up with structure, all this stuff. I know the content pretty well, uh, but I am still working out how best to teach it. And so a given day in teaching is very much sort of like, you know, creating a whole thing. And so we do have some opportunity for steering, uh, but a lot of this is kind of being put together right here at the end. So uh, we do have a chance to kind of do some tweaking. So if you give me uh, feedback, it's something that I can actually work with. 
All right then. So uh, with that piece in mind, um, what I want to do is flip over to ISM structure. All right, and take Gromit off my screen. Okay, uh, so this is, um, uh, when last we spoke, we were working on the interstellar medium and the associated cooling rates uh, for H2 regions. So what that means in terms of uh, cooling rates, uh, I just want to quickly recap. I covered this at the end. Uh, the key parameter when we talk about a cooling rate or we write down a cooling rate for the interstellar medium is this variable big lambda. And big lambda is kind of all the gory details. Um, we work it out, and these end up kind of being tabulated functions uh, that all work depend on it. So, for example, for some of the cooling rates that we talked about in H2 regions, uh, we had the actual temperature of the gas matters, because that uh, deals with the electronic excitation states, the abundances of the cooling species, uh, and you know the electron densities and so on. All that goes in here and gets aggregated into a single function. And so the aggregation that I illustrate here is in this graph uh, where I'm plotting the cooling rate lambda uh, versus temperature. And there's all these individual curves that kind of represent the lines from individual species. Then we end different cooling processes, and then we all add them up. But what's really cool about this is that almost all of the cooling processes are n squared. So they depend on density squared. And then it's pretty straightforward to just aggregate the complicated physics in here. And then you only depend on the state variable nh squared, the density. Uh, of the gas to figure out what the cooling rate is. Now, the last thing that I sort of recapped is that this cooling variable usually has the form of a uh, Boltzmann factor cutoff, so e to the negative delta e over kt. This shows up all the time in thermodynamics, and it sort of indicates the probability of exciting a transition uh, in an atom or in a system given a temperature. So given temperature, how likely is it that I can have an electron hit an atom and excite that internal state that goes on to cool. And then this one over root temperature scaling has to do with the population of electrons. As the temperatures increase, you spread out the electron distribution. And so the probability of finding any given electron at a uh, uh, specific speed uh, drops off. So that's why that uh, scaling is there. And in general, Exponentials are more important than square roots, and so these tend to be rising curves with temperature as we approach that delta, uh, kt approaches delta e there. So they always have a common functional form. I just kind of wanted to explain why. And I wanted to get started here with this e poll question uh, uh, here. So our code is whi, and uh, given I sort of broke up my flow, I'll give you a little bit more setup for this. Uh, the question is, if a cooling rate in a region is 10 the minus 37 watt meter cubed. And if you go back to my poorly traced figure here, uh, that's uh, reading off the y-axis of uh, this uh, graph here. And so at some temperature, we would have you know a cooling rate, say it was 10,000 Kelvin, We or I guess this would be more like 8,000 Kelvin. We would just read off. That would be 10 to the minus 37. It's where that number would come from, like in a homework set or an exam or something. So you read it off the graph, you say, oh, it's 10 to the minus 37 watt meter cube. What is the luminosity of a spherical nebula with a radius of one parsec and a density of NH is 10 to the eighth per meter cube? So uh, when we set this, what we remember is that this epsilon cooling, epsilon cool, has a form that is big lambda times the density squared. And this will give me units of watts per meter cubed. And then we just multiply that at every cubic meter, we get some value of you know, cooling emission. And then we multiply that by the volume of the spherical nebula. <clears throat> spherical, I'm gonna put that in there. Uh, so then the, the, oops, sorry, that is a terrible way to do surgery. Don't, don't, no blackboard surgery, my friends. Uh, instead, so then the power of the cooling, which remember power is luminosity, is then lambda times NH squared times the volume of the region. And I've reminded you of uh, the scale between parsecs and meters. And I'll stop doing that as soon as we manage to have our constants quiz. Okay, uh, so let's open up our e poll and give you a few minutes uh, to uh, 
crack that up. Let's see if I can find my boots. Yeah, there they are. All right, let's uh, start grinding away. I see a lot of answers have come in here. Yeah, uh, sorry about this. Yeah, that says region for the volume there. So uh, to figure out the total luminosity, we take the cooling rate, which is 10 to the minus 37 uh, watts meter cubed. Multiply that by the densities, which are 10 to the 8 per meter cubed quantity squared. We multiply that by a spherical region, 4 thirds pi times the radius, which is 3.09. I only have 3.086 stored in my memory, so that's what I uh, muscle memory does. Uh, and that's 4 pi, 4 thirds pi r cubed. And if I twiddle that out, um, I get that that's about 1.2 times 10 to the uh, 29 watts, which uh, I hope is, uh, yeah, uh, so there's that. And then that's a value that you can sort of come up with. And then uh, if you scale that, it's worth noticing that one solar luminosity is 3.83 times 10 to the 26 watts. I didn't ask to put it in watts, uh, but it's just useful uh, to keep things in mind. That's about 300 solar luminosities. All right, so that gives us the pieces that we need. And so, yeah, this is a way to figure out how much radiation is being lost from this region. It's flowing out and it's radiating away at this 300 solar luminosity. So uh, a fair bit of power coming out in these uh, spectral lines. Any questions on how that played out? Seeing none, I feel like we can move on. Okay, uh, the next thing is, well, what happens with heating? So we uh, talked all about cooling and the opposite process is heating. And when those two come to equilibrium, that's what sets the temperature. Uh, the heating rate in the uh, interstellar medium uh, or in the photoionization region is from photoionization. So what I've drawn over here is kind of a lame schematic diagram of the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. Uh, so you know, EH, where this is, you know, minus 13.6 EV, and then they go up to zero EV, which is a continuum. And photoionization is occurring because a photon comes along, whacks this atom, and then kicks it up here. Uh, and when it's kicked up, if the photon's energy is larger than 
uh, the 13.6 EV, as it should be, it, uh, the electron here is left with a residual velocity. And that is specified by the uh, energy conservation. Uh, last time or two times ago, we worked out what that uh, velocity would be, but it carries that kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy is what ends up heating the gas because we're essentially putting kinetic energy in through photons. And so that heats up the gas here. And so this sort of gross looking integral is just kind of representing uh, that process uh, mathematically. And we could calculate, we can grind this all out um, given the pieces that we have seen because uh, we've kind of set you up for this uh, already. So first, this is the flux of photons coming from uh, the region uh, divided by h nu. So this is the number flux of ionizing photons. And so that's what we calculated way back on homework two. Uh, and so there's a region, we, reason we've cared about that. Uh, keeps coming up. Uh, then this uh, expression here is sigma h times the speed of light. Uh, this is the photoionization cross-section uh, for a hydrogen atom times the speed of light. It has that same sigma v uh, collision rate term that we saw on the uh, cooling rate. So this is basically what's the likelihood of a flux of photons creating a photoionization. So this is the cross-section uh, section rate uh, as per cooling. So same reasoning that we saw there. And that's there. And then this H nu minus E naught, this is the kinetic energy in the gas. Uh, and that's because H nu is the total photon energy coming in, and then it loses E naught to ionize the hydrogen. And so you are left over with this difference. So it's just that marginal amount. And then what you do is you integrate each of these for a given photon. You integrate over the sort of number photon density from uh, the energy of uh, ionization, so things below the ionization cutoff can't actually ionize and therefore won't do any heating, up to infinity. So that gives you the bound. And then so that is basically will give you the flux of particles, uh, the flux of photons that are coming in and the rate at which they're dumping kinetic energy into the gas uh, per, uh, basically per hydrogen atom. And then you multiply by the number density of hydrogen atoms, and that gives you the power per unit volume that you're heating the gas. So I just wanted to sort of walk through the anatomy of where that equation is coming from and the kind of calculations that we would do. Uh, and that's what gives you a curve that looks like uh, this one here in this heating and cooling graph. So it you know, is dropping off as the temperature increases, mostly, uh, you know, represent, uh, mostly representing kind of the dropping in uh, sort of the you know, net heating that can be done given a given temperature of a star. Of course, this depends on the star and all the conditions. I've just illustrated a representative curve, but this heating versus cooling uh, curves, uh, they come to a point and they will intersect. And this intersection point defines the equilibrium. And in that case, basically on a microphysical level, all of the heating from the photoionizations is being balanced locally by the cooling in the nebula. And so then to figure out how, what temperature the ISM is at, you just look for where the heating and cooling rate intersects, read down, and you're like, oh, that's at 10,500 Kelvin in this particular H2 region. So the thing that you could probably expect in an exam context is looking at some, one of the, looking at and interpreting these graphs and trying to figure out, okay, what are, you know, what are the representative rates or what are the equilibrium temperatures given these different curves. 
Um, so that kind of describes how heating and cooling works in an individual H2 region. Uh, as a sort of sidebar, you can apply the exact same reasoning to understand temperature balance throughout the interstellar medium. Uh, and so in the neutral gas, we've been dealing with ionized gas, but in neutral atomic hydrogen gas, you get a very similar set of uh, processes. Uh, instead of heating from photoionization, uh, in the neutral medium, because it's neutral, uh, if it was photoionized, you wouldn't have a neutral medium, uh, but it's uh, there you have photons that are less than 13.6 electron volts, and it's generally ultraviolet photons, so things from sort of 3 to 13 eV are doing a lot of heating, and they're doing a lot of the heating by uh, hitting uh, individual dust grains, and then those dust grains get an electron ejected. So the work function, you may remember that from the actual photoelectric effect, is a few eV for a dust grain. And so then it kicks a electron, an electron out, and that carries the residual kinetic energy of input energy of the photon yeah, times the uh, work function for uh, the dust grain. So it's basically the exact same model, except the things that are contributing hot electrons are dust grains instead of uh, the actual hydrogen atoms themselves. And then you can work out you know, the flux of the ultraviolet field, not necessarily ionizing, but uh, you know, the, the bound that they care about. I guess I just copy pasted the photo ionizing because I made the point here, but if I was being completely annoying, this would be up to the energy level for the hydrogen atom, and then this would be something like the work function. I'm just going to repunctuate that on the slide. So basically it's a different chunk of the spectrum and you just get uh, heating. The main point here, it's the same argument, the same physical structure to the equations, just different things taking the role of what's getting hit and what's contributing electrons here. Uh, cosmic rays do a very similar uh, kind of heating where they'll hit and you know they'll hit a dust grain or an atom and kick off an electron and give some heating that way. Cooling? Again, same pattern as we saw in the nebula. There's a cooling function. It's a two-body process, so it depends on density squared. And you have different lines that are being excited, not, not these fully ionized lines of like oxygen-3 or oxygen-2, uh, but instead these are lower ionization states. So stuff. Uh, these are particles with ionization states that are less than 13.6 eV. So carbon has uh, sort of an ionization potential of 11.5 electron volts, so it tends to be in singly ionized state in the neutral gas. Oxygen has a ionization potential of like 13.63 eV. It's very slightly above hydrogen, so it tends to exist as a neutral uh, particle. And so these uh, lines, ha these atoms have fine structure lines in their ground states, and so what that means is that the, uh, they can have this excited, and the, ener the characteristic energy scale of uh, that is is at about 92 Kelvin. So we can basically play the exact same movie as heating and cooling in the neutral medium as well as in the ionized medium. Uh, but what's one of the neat things that comes from uh, this is if you do this analysis and you basically balance grain photoelectric heating against the carbon and oxygen fine structure cooling lines, you can write down the equilibrium curve. And that leads to this kind of weird graph that you see on the screen here, but I'm going to unpack it for you uh, here. Huh, this, is, this isn't good. My axes have cut off when I copy pasted it. So uh, this is temperature. on the y-axis, and that's in units of Kelvin, and on the x-axis, this is density in units of per meter cubed. And what you see in here is in this temper, oh, sorry, no, this is, that isn't, uh, no, this is intense, this is pressure. So this is pressure over the Boltzmann constant in units of Kelvin meter cubed. Yeah, that's right. Um, so what's happening here is we have an equilibrium curve, and that's what's illustrated with this gray line here. This weird locus, not a function, uh, because temperature is part of the pressure. So remember that this thing on the x-axis is just equal to NH times the temperature. And the... 
Um, so this weird locus of points is the equilibrium line. And if you're at a given temperature and pressure in the interstellar medium, what that means is that you, uh, in equilibrium, you will be at a given temperature. So if I specify uh, a given pressure, that means like at, you know, two times 10 to the nine, I can read up here and I see that the equilibrium temperature in that gas is up here at about 10,000 Kelvin. So, the neat thing about this is that this kind of explains, uh, question here, what is the upper limit on the last integral? Oh, um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll handle that. Uh, so over here, this last integral, I just wrote that down as E naught over H, which is the ionization potential of hydrogen, uh, because once you go above that, you stop being in the neutral medium. Sorry, I just saw that now. Um, okay, uh, coming back here, the... Um, uh, this temperature phase space here and the equilibrium curve uh, that we have gives us an explanation for why there's a cold neutral medium and why there's a warm neutral medium. Why are there basically gas at a couple thousand Kelvin, you know, 100 to a couple thousand Kelvin, and gas up at about 8,000 Kelvin, uh, and then not much gas in between? That's a consequence of this heating and cooling. And so what happens here is that this equilibrium curve kind of partitions the space into two dimensional into two dimensions. And over here on the left side of the graph, that's a place where heating is dominant. You get more heating than cooling uh, here. And so the heating rate is higher than the cooling rate. Over here, vice versa, cooling rate bigger than heating rate. And then this is kind of a contour through this interval, into, through this space where the two uh, lines are exactly equal. So thermal equilibrium happens on this line. But this uh, interstellar medium is unstable in certain parts. So what does that mean by stability? Well, let's consider a point here like point A on the graph. And what happens if from point A, I make the interstellar medium a little hotter? So that means I displace upward into th this space. So we go from 8,000 Kelvin to like 10,000 Kelvin. There's a perturbation or something. And it comes by and then in that case, cooling is larger than heating. And so what that happens then is that the little, uh, in this little sort of parameter space, it moves back to the equilibrium point. And that's a sign of a stable thermal equilibrium. If I make it hotter, the cool, it pushes it into a domain where the cooling is dominant, and so then it cools back down to equilibrium. A similar thing is happening down here at point C, where if I say I make it uh, colder, it moves into a regime where it's uh, the heating dominates the cooling, and so then it kind of pushes it back towards equilibrium. It heats it on back up. Uh, and then, uh, so there, I'll finish the punchline, I'll get to the question. Uh, and so then finally, at the uh, this point B here, we have an unstable equilibrium. So if I push it upward, from this into uh, this point and make it a little hotter, what's happening is it moves into a regime where it's hotter. And so it's kind of a runaway process. It gets pushed up, it's hotter, the heating dominates and it makes it hotter and hotter and hotter. So something that's perturbed off of this space will move up here and go to this new equilibrium. And if I'm pushed down, you go into a region where there's cooling and it moves down to this space here and you come to equilibrium on the bottom branch of this graph. So the question in the chat is, what is the bottom axis? This is pressure in the interstellar medium. And I picked pressure to plot this, or rather the person whose uh, graph I traced uh, to give you this uh, free uh, uh, version is uh, you plot this in terms of pressure. And the reason that's important is the pressure in the interstellar medium is roughly constant and it kind of hangs out in this region here where we have three to five thousand, uh, three to five, th three, sorry, three to five billion uh, Kelvin per meter cubed. 
And so it sort of hangs out in the space because of this equipartition nature of the interstellar medium. And that means that we're right in this point where this curve is doing this S shape, and that S shape is what's giving us this unstable neutral medium. And so that's why we get two phases of the interstellar medium in our galaxy. But you'll notice that if the pressure increases, I can end up over here. And if for some reason I have more uh, higher pressure in the interstellar medium, uh, that turns out to be from the gravitational field of the galaxy, then we'll go into a state where it's almost all in the cold neutral medium. And if I have a lower pressure, that means it's all going to be up here in the warm neutral medium. And that's important because the cold neutral medium is what ends up forming molecular clouds and then goes on to form stars. And so if we get into a state where all of your neutral gas is in the warm neutral medium, you're gonna have a very different mode of star formation. And so this particular graph is an underlying reason why different galaxies have different star formation properties. So I'm going to check, I'm gonna basically write a check here on your confusion and you'll stare at this and you'll start to understand it. And then I'm gonna come back in like four weeks and totally cash that check and be like, and this is why spiral galaxies behave differently from irregular galaxies. Thank you very much. And you're gonna just be, oh no, I don't know what's gonna happen. But that's, uh, that's the point of kind of illustrating this here. Wow. Okay, so that's a fairly complex and dense topic, so I want to pause now for any questions. All right, I see no chatsy chatsies coming. So, final point on heating and cooling. I think final point. Uh, okay, I have an example. Uh, final point on heating and cooling is that uh, we can basically write down the heating and cooling rates sort of zoomed out for typical interstellar medium conditions. So the graph I was showing you poorly uh, earlier, that's kind of a narrow range of just photoionized regions. And if I sort of zoom out and sort of look at this over a huge space of temperature, uh, in the ISM for kind of typical uh, density conditions, I can write down what the heating and cooling rates are and uh, over this wide range of temperature for all the common physics, uh, physical mechanisms. And you'll see that the cooling rates are low down here at this end and up here they're high up here at uh, about 100,000 uh, Kelvin. And then they dip back down for temperatures of about a million Kelvin. Uh, and that turns out to be a very physically important uh, thing to note for uh, what comes next in our study of the interstellar medium. And indeed, this uh, particular bump right here explains a lot about the feeding of galaxies. So we'll get to that in a bit. So this cooling curve and the sort of detailed physics of what gas is doing and how it's exchanging energy with its environment is uh, at the heart of a lot of galaxy evolution. So we'll be coming back to this, but there is this sort of global structure and balance between kind of heating and cooling. Uh, so if I look at this and I kind of consider a blob of gas uh, here in uh, this regime that's about 5,000 Kelvin, this is in that unstable section of the neutral medium. So something like right here uh, in the gas. Uh, yeah, I guess a little higher, more up here. Um, yeah, that is an unstable section of the medium. And so the question you might have is, well, how long does it take to kind of move up or down off of this curve. And so what I'm gonna do is kind of consider uh, this thing of what is a cooling time here. And so the reason I want to work this as an example is it's kind of a case in point of how we illustrate the characteristic time scales for certain processes to happen. And uh, we think about this in this kind, you know, it's complicated and the temperatures will change, but we do the dumbest possible thing, which is sort of an instantaneous estimation of uh, the time it takes for uh, the process to occur in just kind of a very simple distance equals rate times time linear approximation. And here uh, what we do is we equate that the power uh, in the cooling times the time, so the power is the rate in the cooling, uh, times the time it takes to cool is equal to the thermal energy in the gas. And so basically the thermal energy is the distance in our simple model 
the power is the rate, and then the time is the time. So what we can do is we can basically use this as a characteristic time scale estimate for how long it takes for this process to occur. In particular, the cooling time then is the thermal energy divided by the power in cooling. And we have expressions for both of these. First, the thermal energy is 3 halves kT times the density, nH. So that's basically the thermal energy per unit volume. Uh, here. And then we can write down the cooling rate uh, per unit volume. I guess I should probably use this as, yeah. I think for consistency, I would use an epsilon here. But this is the power rate per unit volume, and we have an expression for that. That's lambda nh squared. So that gives me uh, the values that I'm looking at. I can cancel, I can undo, cancel off some powers here and uh, just rewrite this uh, as uh, 3 kT over 2 lambda nh. And so this gives me the characteristic time, and all I have to do now is plug in some numbers. Uh, we have Boltzmann constant, uh, 3 times 10, 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin. Uh, the temperature here for the unstable neutral medium is about 5,000 Kelvin. And then we'll divide that by 2 times the cooling rate that I would read off of the graph, 3 times 10 to the minus 37 watt meter cubed. And then I multiply that by uh, the uh, volume density that I care about, 10 to the 6 meter uh, per meter cubed. And if I uh, kick that out, I get an answer. It's 1.7 times 10 to the 11 seconds, which is huge and difficult to track. Uh, but that's more like uh, 5,000 years which in cosmic scale, not long. So these thermal processes are fast. They really kind of clip along and change the equilibrium because they're really you know, set by the collision times and how long it takes for light to leave the system, both of which are fast on a cosmic time scale. Oh, sorry, I should ask if there are any questions. because the last part of the interstellar medium are explosions. And yeah, it's one of the things that physics does well. Uh, so interstellar medium, uh, the last case study is what happens to a supernova. Uh, heating and cooling was interesting because that sort of established what, how we get the phase structure of the interstellar medium is a combination of the photoionization and the heating and cooling. Now with supernova explosions, we sort of talk a little bit about fluid flows here. And the basic question is what happens when you release 10 to the 44 joules of mechanical energy into the interstellar medium? So I made the case back in stellar evolution that you know massive stars end their lives and they dump 10 to the 44 joules into the ISM. You just got your homework set four back where you calculated the supernova rate in the galaxy and you know that there's basically one of these explosions in the galaxy every 50 years or so. And so that kicks out more uh, kinetic, uh, kinetic energy. And so the effects, uh, this, this ends up affecting the galaxy a lot. And so what we want to know is how do we end up, you know, stirring up the gas as a result of these? And so what we're going to do is we're going to develop a model for how those explosions play out by saying, okay, I'll put a point explosion into the galaxy and send it outward and then watch the evolution of that shock front. A supernova explosion, typically, like when it's coming out after you form the neutron star, throwing off the outer layers, uh, the gas is leaving the system at a tenth the speed of light, which is fast. It's not relativistically annoyingly fast. You know, we are gamma parameters there are pretty tiny, uh, or pretty close to one, I should say. Uh, and so we don't have to worry about relativity too much, but it's still a lot of kinetic energy compared to what's in the interstellar medium. Uh, in particular, when we're making the comparison, we compare that to the speed of sound in the interstellar medium. And uh, we'll st uh, so uh, an example of a supernova explosion is shown here on the right. This is the Crab uh, supernova remnant, or Crab Nebula. It's in Taurus. You can see it with a good pair of binoculars, or on our observatory should we open up ever again. Um, yeah, it's visible right now. And so the things that you're seeing here are the outer layers of the star that have been kicked out and the local gas that is starting to get mixed in. 
Uh, this is uh, the product of what's called SN1054. Uh, I guess it's 1054A, technically, which is a supernova explosion that happened in the year 1054. And so here we are 1,100 years on, and we know that this explosion has moved outward uh, by that distance here. And so we can, in principle, calculate how it is, how fast it's going and how it is slowing down over the course of time. Inside uh, the supernova remnant, uh, or this is a supernova remnant, and inside this kind of shock is a region of very hot gas, uh, so typically million Kelvin gas uh, out here, and it's exploding into a medium here that has much lower temperatures, uh, 10,000 Kelvin or even 100 Kelvin, uh, depending on what it's exploding into. And so we uh, want to compare these supernova explosions to the local sound speed because that basically says as long as you're moving substantially faster than the sound speed, then this will create a shock wave. And uh, the reference velocity here, what we'll use is the adiabatic one-dimensional sound speed. So we kind of estimated the characteristic speed of particles in a gas, uh, and that turns out to be about a factor of root three larger because that was a measure in three dimensions, uh, and sound speeds, because sound speeds are these longitudinal compression waves, we care about them in one dimension. So that's why this formula carries a slightly different power than what we were calculating for the typical particle speeds earlier. Uh, the adiabatic sound speed in a gas is root gamma kt over m, where this gamma is that adiabatic constant gamma. So p goes like rho to the gamma in an adiabatic gas. It's five-thirds for a monatomic ideal gas. And what we do is we sort of express this in terms of a Mach number. So a, the Mach number of shocks is much, much larger than one. And so the uh, sonic Mach number, uh, there are non, there are alvanic Mach numbers as well, but the sonic Mach number is just the speed of the flow or the shock compared to the sound speed. And if we get a number that's 10 or 100 or larger, this is going to create a shock wave. And that's because the fluid, uh, the, the fluid flow is moving through the medium faster than pressure waves can propagate. That's what an adiabatic sound wave is, is this pressure wave moving through the gas. And so the gas can't get out of the way. And so it's sort of, sit the, it's sort of sitting there and the shock wave just comes through before any uh, information about the fluid flow can communicate, hey, there's a density disturbance coming. Maybe you want to flow being a fluid or something. Instead, in a shock wave, you just get, uh, you know, you just get hit with the shock wave and you end up kind of incorporating that material into the shock wave. So shocks are typically what we call thin. Uh, this graph uh, or this figure over here is showing a shock wave in uh, the large Magellanic cloud. It has some numerical thing. And you can see that the edge of the shock wave here is, is really razor thin compared to the uh, gas around here. And again, you can see that it's kind of lighting up inside from that million Kelvin gas cooling down. So when we see light from hot gas, that's the cooling channels of the gas here. And so this up here is, again, gas kind of cooling. It's this nice thin uh, shock wave. Uh, so uh, I have been yakking at you for way too long, so I thought it'd be good just to put in a little e-poll question here. Uh, try it out. What's the adiabatic sound speed uh, for the warm neutral medium if the temperature is 8,000 uh, Kelvin?
All right, good. Uh, got the answers coming in. Uh, this is really a plug and chug uh, formula. So we just stick in that the adiabatic constant is 5 thirds. Uh, then we have Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin. Uh, the temperature is 8,000 Kelvin. The mass of the particle will just be a hydrogen atom, 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Uh, throw that into a square root, and out comes an answer that's like 1.05 times 10 to the 4 uh, meters per second, or just sticks in my head because of characteristic speed in galaxies is well expressed in kilometers per second. That's about 10 kilometers per second. So that's a useful measure to keep in mind. Uh, here. And so this also tells us when supernova explosions end. Uh, that's basically when the fluid flow reaches a speed that's about 10 kilometers, slows down and re reaches a speed of about the sound speed in uh, the medium that it's in. Then it kind of gets swept up and wrapped into uh, the gas there and the pressure waves from the ambient medium basically dissipate and disturb it. Uh, so you will no longer see a supernova explosion. So this kind of gives us the physical setup that we want to do. Okay, any questions on that thing? I do like some of the answers that we get here. Yeah, it's, it's large. Very correct. You are not wrong. Okay, so what's going to happen next is we're going to actually work through the physical setup for how one of these shock waves propagates. Um, and then, so I'll do a little, talk about the physical setup here. And then on Friday, I'll take part of the class, I have sort of a short data exercise. So I'll take part of the class so we can wrap up supernova explosions, be done with the interstellar medium, and we'll come back from reading break and sort of go full into uh, stellar dynamics. So from there, uh, what will, you know, in a sort of galaxy context. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to set up what's called the set off solution, which is the uh, sort of name of the solution for the evolution of a supernova remnant. And we kind of imagine what happens in a supernova explosion explosion as a thin spherical shell of matter that's propagating outward and uh, we set up where the supernova explosion is there at the center of the shell. We have uh, the size of the shell uh, or the shock wave is a radius r. We'll assume it's a spherical uh, explosion and it's propagating into a medium with a mass density of rho naught and the mass density is important here uh, because um, the material is being swept up into the shock front. So we need to know how much mass gets accumulated into that shock front. And the supernova explosion is going to have two distinct evolutionary phases. In the first phase, we call this the adiabatic phase. And it's just happening so quickly that the entire system is going to conserve energy. And this gas is just going to be pushed forward and kind of obey the uh, rules of adiabatic uh, gas uh, flows and it's going to just conserve energy all the way through. Uh, but after a period of time, you've got a bunch of really hot gas at high densities, it starts to cool. And once we get to a point where you reach the typical cooling time for gas at that high temperature and density, then the energy losses through radiation are going to become significant. So we are tagging back to what we covered earlier in this lecture at that kind of million Kelvin temperatures up there at that little bump in the cooling curves. So then we move into a case where radiative losses are important and it no longer conserves energy. Instead, it's going to conserve momentum. And so then we're going to transition into this momentum conserving phase. So we want to understand what's happening in both of these phases, which ones take longer, how long does it typically take for an explosion to take place. And so what we can do is we can calculate the size of the supernova remnant and the speed of the shock front, which is just the time derivative of the size. So dr by dt is the, is the radial flow outward uh, for this medium.
And so just to set this up, uh, and we'll do the math next. Mm, oh, it just ticked over to 150. Joe, we will set this up next time and come over and uh, do the math then. All right, so that's a wrap for today. I will uh, see you on Friday. We will explode some stars and find out where the center of the galaxy is. So uh, until then, I hope you have a wonderful, oh, we, we all know what time of year it is. Uh, I hope you survive until Friday. Good luck with everything else that you got going on. Take care.